Chapter One of Bizarre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nick Bulka. Bizarre by Lawton McCall. Chapter One Unsolicited Personal Adornments. Have you ever, on returning home from a round of calls, discovered upon your coat a large, obtrusive spot? Stricken with horror, you wonder how long it has been there. Did you have this adjunct when you appeared before your wealthy aunt? That severe female has never quite approved of you, and now this will finish you as far as she is concerned. Did you exhibit yourself thus disgraced at the Brumleys? You recollect that the maid eyed you queerly when she opened the door, and that Mrs. B. had frequent recourse to her lorgnettes. Then, too, both the Greens and the Worthingtons seemed a little stiffer than usual. How did you acquire it, anyhow? It looks and feels like ice cream of a very rich quality ice cream that has drippled merrily in leaps and bounds. But you had no ice cream today. Neither did you talk to anyone who was having ice cream. Perhaps you have been struck by ice cream, just as people are struck by lightning. The weather does such peculiar things nowadays. I have a gray suit that is a constant prey to spots. Its frail color a sickly betwixt and between shade chosen in haste and repented of at leisure puts it utterly at their mercy and they flock to it things sticky and gluttonous pounds avidly upon it nor is its seat reserved from paints and varnishes sauces afflict it oils take advantage of its helplessness grass bedizens it with garish green i try my best to protect it but what can i do what am i against so many while i am rescuing my left elbow from the machinations of a passing dish i unwittingly suffer my right cuff to be enticed by the gravy in my plate as i walk discreetly in the middle of the sidewalk an automobile out in the street salutes me with a volley of mud, and the most notable spots happen mysteriously. They appear out of the air, as it were, like the pictures that Frost makes on window panes. I submit the phenomenon of their strange origin to the scientific world as an instance of spontaneous generation. This spotability of my gray suit is surpassed only by the achievements of my blue serge. I shall not here discuss my English tweeds, nor my Scotch cheviots, nor the braided cutaway and the lounge suit that I had made for me in Bond Street, for fear the reader might divine that I never possessed those garments. This suit is not a victim to spots. It deliberately invites them. It is a connoisseur, a discriminating collector. Scorning such vulgarities as paint and pitch, it seeks the exotic, the outre, amazing stickinesses, bewildering viscosities, undreamed of goos. Although delighting in intricacy of design, and delicate nuances of shading, it prefers durability to all other qualities. Some of its antiquities, particularly a brownish-white one, resembling an octopus, over the front pocket, have stood the test of time and clothes brushes. On three occasions, this remarkable collection has been almost entirely destroyed by benzene, but each time the principal specimens have survived intact. These cleanings divide the history of the suit 
into four epochs. Spots of the fourth or present epoch are of small consequence. Spots of the third and second epochs are more interesting, while spots which antedate the first great deluge are quite rare. Among these last are the octopus and other gems of the collection. Once, when I had become exceedingly irked at having to go about clad in pseudo-tapestry, I handed the suit over to a desperado of a ladies' and gents' tailor, a man who had the reputation of being capable of getting anything out of anything or anybody, and besought him to raise the frescoes. He attacked them after the manner customary to cleaners. That is to say, he drove out the spots with smells. Only he used smells that were nothing short of brutal. The rout was complete. When he brought my suit to my room on Saturday night, I could hardly believe my eyes. Being forced, however, to believe my nose, I hastily opened the window. I could understand why the spots had departed. I even felt sorry for them. Not daring to put the suit away, for fear of contaminating the rest of my apparel, I hung it over the back of a chair by the window. But the incoming breeze, instead of carrying the aroma away, wafted it directly toward me. It was certainly strong. It fairly assaulted the nostrils. One good whiff of that vicious chemical was almost enough to make you dizzy. It treated me as if I were a spot. I picked up a book and tried to read, but could not concentrate my attention. The spot destroyer was continually interrupting. My head was spinning so that I could hardly see. I realized that the life of a spot was not a happy one. Thinking that smoking might help, I was about to light a cigarette when I remembered reading in the paper of people who struck matches in fume-filled rooms and then were blown blocks and blocks without knowing what hit them. So I gave that up and sat a while, dejected. Then another scary thought came into my mind. What if I should be asphyxiated? I pictured myself being found dead in bed, having been extinct for hours and hours, and the mournfulness of it broke me all up. Overcome with emotion and spot destroyer, I gathered a few things into a suitcase and went out to spend the night at a hotel. When I returned to my room on the following evening, the aroma had gone and the rays of the setting sun illuminating the old blue suit as it hung there on the back of the chair, showed me a host of familiar faces, particularly that of an especially offensive brownish-white octopus over the pocket. They had come back, every one. Not a design was missing. End of chapter 1